The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Good afternoon. I would like to welcome you all to the third lecture of the 2016 Everhart Lecture Series. My name is Constantine, and I am the chair of the Everhart Committee. The Everhart Lecture Series is a program funded by the Graduate Office and supported by the Graduate Student Council. It is a forum which encourages interdisciplinary interactions among students and faculty and recognizes the exemplary presentation and research abilities of Caltech's graduate students. Each fall, three lectures are selected by an interdisciplinary committee of fellow graduate students based on their dynamic speaking skills, their ability to communicate their research field's broader importance, and their impact on the scientific community. As you all know, Caltech has an abundance of outstanding graduate students who have all of these qualities, and choosing just three from each year's candidates is certainly no easy task. In fact, we had so many great candidates this year that we couldn't narrow it down to only three and selected four. The third of this truly exceptional group is Catherine Schredder from the Department of Biology and Bioengineering. At this point, I would like to ask Professor Sarkis Masmanian to come up and introduce Catherine. So it's a, it's a pleasure to introduce Katie uh, for, this, for this lecture series. Uh, I'll keep this brief. Uh, so Katie uh, uh, applied to the Caltech biology program in 2011, I believe. Uh, and I remember that because that was my last year on the graduate admissions committee. Um, I have a lot more free time now since, uh, since I stepped down from that committee. But I remember, I remember her application distinctly. And you know, I can tell you is that we were all very, we on the committee were all very enthusiastic about, about Katie's application and subsequently very enthusiastic as she accepted to, to come to Caltech to do her graduate work. And so she was a, a neuroscience major at the University of Virginia and um, joined Caltech in 2012. And I was even happier when she applied to our laboratory and decided to join our lab. And so at the time, um, you know, our lab had become interested in the connections between the microbiome, gut bacteria, and neuroscience. But for those of you who know me, I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm a microbiologist. And I'm not sure I know any, any more neuroscience now than I did in 2012. But, um, but you know, we have multiple projects in neuroscience in the lab. And what this tells you is that the people in the lab, even beyond just the neuroscience, work very, very independently. Um, they teach me on a daily basis uh, about, the, about their projects and about the, the fascinating discoveries they're making. But in Katie's case, I think that's even, even more uh, uh, unique, is because our lab has worked historically only on mice. And as you, as you see and as you will continue to see, she's, uh, she works on Drosophila. So we've never worked on Drosophila. I know, I know what I know about Drosophila is what Katie's taught me. And I think that's just, once again, a testimony to her independence and what she's done. And so ultimately, the, the project and her discoveries are hers and hers alone. Katie? Thank you, Sargis, for that introduction. And thank you to the Graduate Student Council, as well as the Graduate Student Office, for providing me with this opportunity to talk to you today. And today I'm going to take you on a short journey into your gastrointestinal tract. And your gastrointestinal tract houses not only your host cells, but also that of bacteria, viruses, and fungi. And these can then interact with your host cells and can also aid in terms of digestion. And so probably when you first think about bacteria, you first think about the multitude of different headlines that we're constantly inundated with in terms of bacteria being bad for you and them also causing diseases and causing infection. However, it's been known since about the 60s that certain bacteria can actually be beneficial for you. And so it's really become now the subject of multiple different studies. And so really, since about the past 15 to 20 years, individuals like my advisor have looked into how specific bacteria can actually cause an effect on the host and can cause a beneficial effect on that particular host. And so one of the ways in which they've looked at this is in terms of that of immunity and immune surveillance. Others have also looked at metabolism and metabolic regulation. And so really now what's come into focus in terms of popular culture is actually the microbiota being a beneficial source for you. And so some examples of microbial influence on the host is one in which that is found in terms of Drosophila or your average household fly. 
And within your average household fly, there's many different bacteria. But two of those that are important are Acetobacter pymorium and Lactobacillus plantarum. And these two particular bacteria can actually have an effect on insulin signaling. And so they can have an effect on the actual metabolic regulation of the host cells. And then this can cause an effect on the development of that particular organism. So these particular bacteria can have an effect on the host's metabolic regulation and ultimately on how the host develops. In addition to this particular host-specific regulation, the microbiota can also have an effect on diet and how the diet is broken down. So when you think of just your normal average diet that you're ingesting, you're probably ingesting some fiber. And so that's what's represented by these complex polysaccharides. And then this can then be broken down by the gut microbiota into short-chain fatty acids, abbreviated here as SCFAs. And so these particular byproducts of the gut microbiota can actually have an effect locally on the colonic epithelium as well as the local immune system. But they can not only just have these effects locally, but they can also have systemic effects reaching to that of the brain. And one way in which they can do this is through impacting the circulatory system. So they can circulate through the system to the brain and then cause an effect on the brain. Another way in which you find that the gut microbiota or microbial products can have an effect is through that of the gastrointestinal tract. So your gastrointestinal tract is lined with a complex set of neurons. And this complex set of neurons is called the enteric nervous system. And the enteric nervous system can then relay that information to the brain through a nerve called the vagus nerve. And so this can then cause an effect on the brain's output. And one of the most important outputs of the brain is that of behavior. And so some of the behaviors that have already been looked into is that of mating behavior, social behavior, as well as learning and memory. And so when you think about these behaviors, these behaviors are actually rather complex behaviors. And they contain multiple different components. And so it's very difficult for us to be able to get at how exactly the microbiota is causing an effect on these specific behaviors. So what we decided to do was we decided to pick a more simplistic behavior for this study. And one of that is locomotion. And so locomotion is important in many different ways, but I'm going to touch upon a couple of brief ways in which locomotion is important. One of the first ways locomotion is important is in terms of finding and locating a food source and staying on that food source. Additionally, you can also think about locomotion in terms of its importance in terms of finding a shelter when there is an external stimuli like rain, as it is today, or an earthquake. Also, you can also think of locomotion as being important in order to find and locate a mate. And so locomotion is not only important in terms of the survival of the organism, but also important in terms of it propagating its genes and passing its genes onto offspring. And so the question that I wanted to address was, can the microbiota influence this important behavior of locomotion. <coughs> and so what we needed to do for this was we needed to pick a model organism. And so as Sarkis talked about in his introduction, we normally focus in on the mouse. And that is because it's actually very humanly relevant, both in terms of its composition as well as in terms of its genetics. However, due to this huge diversity of bacteria, it's very difficult to get at what particular bacteria might be doing in terms of the its effect on the host. Additionally, because of the turnover of the, of the mice and because of the number of offspring it produces, this causes it to be very difficult to do high throughput genetic screening. So we decided to pick that of the fly. And so the fly, or Drosophila melanogaster, has a limited number of bacteria, allowing us to be able to look at specific bacteria and figure out how they have an effect on the host. Additionally, we can also do high throughput genetic screenings to see how this particular bacterium is having an effect on the host. And so when you think about your average fly that's just flying around, probably in this room, it has a diverse microbiota. So it has many different bacteria, and it also has many different numbers of those particular bacteria. And so what we need to do in order to study locomotion and to study the effect of the microbiota on locomotion is to remove these bacteria. And so we need to create flies that have no microbiota, or flies that are exenic. And so the conventional flies are ones in which have a full microbiota, and the exenic <coughs> flies are ones in which have no microbiota. 
And so how we generate these flies is through taking Drosophila embryos. And so flies pass on their microbiota through the outer shell casing of the embryo. And so what we have to do is we have to then remove this outer shell casing in order to remove the bacteria. So what we go through is we go through serial steps of, sorry, serial steps of bleach, ethanol, and then sterile water, all in a sterile environment, basically removing that outer shell casing. And then we place it on top of a sterile medium. And how we generate the sterile medium is we basically use a radiation in order to remove the bacteria. And so then the question that we need to ask is we've already generated these exanic flies, so we can ask the question of whether the absence of bacteria has an effect. But we need to act back particular bacteria and ask whether a particular bacteria has an effect. So for this, we need to do monocolonization. And monocolonization is basically the idea of associating one particular host with a particular bacterial species. And so how we can do this is through placing our flies, our exenic flies, onto a media, and then taking a bacterial culture, so one that just only has a particular bacterium, and placing it onto that media. So the flies are constantly walking around and ingesting that bacterium. And so now that I've discussed how we are going to remove and add bacteria, I now want to discuss how we are going to examine locomotion. And so locomotion is probably a behavior that you don't normally think about, unless you're you know, standing up in front of a group of people or unless you are a child trying to walk for the first time. But locomotion can actually be broken down into many different components. And so one of which is that of a fine grain attribute of locomotion. And locomotion can, as seen here with a Parkinson's patient moving a spoon to a particular bowl, you can see that actually in order to move a particular appendage to a certain region, you can have a certain specificity of that locomotion attribute. Additionally, you can look at locomotion in terms of a broader scale and in terms of how in which we move. And this is shown through Michael Jackson moving across the stage. He moves a lot better than I would probably move, but the idea here is that you can move fast and also in directionality is important in terms of locomotion. And so how we need to test this in terms of our flies is we need to test in three separate ways. So we need to test the fine grain motor approach, so the fine motor coordination of the flies in terms of the gait of the fly. And we also need to look at more broader features of locomotion in terms of the speed and the daily activity of the flies. And so each of these particular tests and particular assays that I'm looking at are actually on different time scales. So gait is on like a seven, time, seven second time scale. And speed is on about a 10 minute time scale. Whereas daily activity is over the course of three days. So we're looking to see whether the microbiota is important in terms of a specific feature of locomotion or whether it can actually have an impact on all of these behaviors. And so first, we wanted to test out of gait. And so in order to do this, we took our flies to Columbia University and we partnered up with the Marca Lab at Columbia. And so what we're doing here is we're placing our flies onto an optical glass. And then we are passing through that glass an LED light. So what we can do is we can look at changes in the refracted, refracted light. And so changes in that refracted light can indicate where the fly is placing its limbs. And we can then record that through a high-speed camera. And the videos that you get are something similar to that of this. And so what you're seeing here is you're seeing a fly move across the screen. And what you're seeing in those circles is each of the fly's placement of its limbs. And so the different, not the different uh, initials here are representing a different appendage. And so what we can do from this is we can basically extract out the features of this video and look at how the fly is moving and where the fly is placing its limbs. And so from this, one of the features that we can look at is that of stance. And so when you think about stance in terms of the way that I'm standing, it's with two feet on the floor at this time. If I was a bit more relaxed, I might be standing with one foot on the floor or something of that nature. But flies have six limbs, so they're going to have many different combinations. And one of the, of the stances we looked at was that of a tripod stance. And so a tripod stance is the ability of having three limbs on the ground at one time. And so we can measure the tripod stance in terms of the tripod index. And so this is just the number of times in which a fly has three limbs on the ground at one time. 
And so the question we're asking here is does the presence of the microbiota significantly change the tripod index? So does it change whether or not the likelihood that I'm going to have three limbs in the ground at one time? And what we find is that our conventional flies, so the flies that have a full microbiota, significantly differ in terms of the tripod index to those that have a full microbiota. And this is indicated here by the asterisk, which is representing a p-value of less than 0.05. And so what we are seeing here is that the presence of the microbiota is significantly changing whether or not the likelihood of me having three limbs on the ground at one time if I'm a fly. And so the next question that we need to address is we need to address whether this is a general feature of the microbiota or whether this is more specific to a particular bacterium or whether the fact that me doing these harsh stages with the xenic flies is actually too detrimental to basically cause an effect back down with just one particular species. So what we need to look at next is we need to look at the microbial composition of Drosophila. And this is the similar a representative group of the microbial composition in Drosophila. And so we decided to pick two of the most prominent as well as the two of the most, most studied bacterium, and that is Lactobacillus plantarum and Lactobacillus brevis. And so what we are asking here is when we have our conventional flies, we see a change in the tripod index versus that of our xenic flies. And so what we're asking is if I add back one particular species, so if I do that monocolonization that I was talking about, does that cause an effect? So what we're trying to do is we're monocolonizing with either Lactobacillus plantarum or Lactobacillus brevis, and then asking what is the effect on tripod index. So first, we associated with Lactobacillus plantarum. And what we found was that there was no significant effect on the tripod index, indicated here by the non-significant feature. So if you have a, even though you see a slight change of the bars between the xenic and the plantarum, there is actually no effect and no significant effect. And so it's not a, fe a feature of just any particular bacterium that can have an effect, but it actually might be more specific. And so next we colonize with just Lactobacillus brevis. And what we see is that, yes, in fact, a particular bacterium actually can restore the levels back down to that of conventional flies. And so this is now being specific in terms of the fact that Lactobacillus plantarum cannot do this, but brevis can cause an effect. And so next, we had only been looking at a particular small time scale, and we need to scale up and take a step back. And so we need to look at testing speed. And so the way in which we do this is we place the flies into a circular arena. And this arena is limiting the flies only to a two-dimensional space. So they can only move around. They can't fly. They can't jump. They basically can only move around that two-dimensional space. And then we record that, them moving in that space and then use computer vision in order to track the flies and also to extract the features of how they're moving. And so we can look at speed. And so again, looking at the conventional versus the xenic flies, what we see is that the presence of the microbiota causes a significant effect on locomotion and on the speed of the flies. So it's not just on the gait, it's also on speed. And so again, we need to address whether this is a general feature of the microbiota or whether it's more specific. And so again, we look at monocolonizing with Lactobacillus plantarum. And we find that it's not able to cause an effect on the speed of the flies. And so then when we colonize with Lactobacillus brevis, however, it is able to cause a significant effect on the speed of the flies, indicating that it's something that is more specific to Lactobacillus brevis rather than just a general feature of the microbiota. And so next, we also need to take a further step back and look at the activity of the flies. So look at how exactly they are moving over the course of days, since we had only been looking at a time frame of about 10 minutes. And when we do this, how we do it is through using this assay. And so in this assay, the flies are in their normal vials. And so they have their media, and they are also confined by a stopper. And so what we do is we pass an infrared beam through these vials, and then look at how many times they cross this particular beam. And so what you can do is you can see the fly cross, and then we count that as one. And so for this, then we can record over the course of days and look to see whether the presence or absence of the microbiota can cause a significant effect on the activity of the flies. 
And what we find is that yes, in fact, the presence of the microbiota can cause a significant effect on the activity of the flies. So it's not only just an effect on the gait or an effect on the speed of the flies, but it's also over the course of days can have an effect. And so again, we need to address the question of whether this is a general feature or whether this is more specific. Because it might just be that the lactobacillus brevis, while it was able to cause an effect at these lower levels, it might not be able to cause an effect at this higher level. And so when we look at lactobacillus planetarum, again, we see that there is no significant effect on the activity of the fly. And so next, moving to lactobacillus brevis, we find that lactobacillus brevis is able to rescue the, the fly's activity. And so it's able to cause the same effect as that of the conventional flies, indicating that it is something that is more specific to that of brevis rather than just a general feature of the microbiota. And so what lactobacillus brevis is able to do when it's monocolonized is it's able to cause a significant effect on gait, speed, and daily activity. So it's able to affect all three of the different assays that I looked at in terms of locomotion. However, when we were doing these particular feeder cures, we were monocolonizing the flies. And when I was talking in my introduction, I was talking about the fact that normally in your average, day, your average fly, there is a diversity of microbes. And so this is actually more of an artificial system. So it might just be that while Brevis is able to cause an effect in this monocolonization system, it might not be able to cause an effect when there's a diversity of microbes within the gut. So we need to move to the conventional flies and ask the question of if we add back, if we add more lactobacillus brevis, can this also cause an effect on the speed of the fly? And we use lactobacillus plantarum as our control for this. And so when we add lactobacillus brevis, we actually find that it's able to cause a significant effect on the conventional flies, indicating that it is not just something that is inherent to our artificial system of monocolonization. It's actually something that might be occurring in nature. And so what we have found is that lactobacillus brevis, not lactobacillus plantarum, is able to cause an effect on locomotion. And probably what you might have noticed is that on all my slides, I indicate that this is the strain EW. And so a strain is just a particular type of that bacterium. So it has certain genetic differences from that of other strains of that particular bacterium. So it might be that this particular strain is able to cause an effect on locomotion, but there might be other strains that are not able to cause this effect. So it might be something that is more unique to EW rather than unique to lactobacillus brevis as a group. And so what we did for this is we tested other strains. However, when we test these other strains, they're also able to have an effect on locomotion, indicating that it is not just something that is specific to EW, but it is something that is more general to lactobacillus brevis. Next, what we also needed to do was we needed to look at other commensals within Drosophila because we need to ask the question of whether it is something that is specific to lactobacillus brevis or can another bacterium do this? And additionally, also, maybe it just might be that planetarium is not able to cause an effect on locomotion, but everyone else is able to actually cause that effect. So what we needed to do is we needed to take two other commensals, which is that of Acetobacter tropicalis and Acetobacter pimorium, as well as two other that are no not normally found within Drosophila which is that of E. coli and this particular strain of E. faecalis. And what we find is that, in fact, Acetobacter tropicalis is able to cause an effect, and A. pimorium, E. coli, and E. faecalis are not able to cause an effect on locomotion, indicating that it's not necessarily something that is unique to Lactobacillus brevis, but can actually be happening in other bacteria as well. And so what we have found is that addressing that first question of can the microbiota influence locomotion, we have found that yes, in fact, Acetobacter tropicalis and Lactobacillus brevis can cause this effect. However, the other bacteria that we have tested cannot. And so next, the next major question that we wanted to ask was how does Lactobacillus brevis influence locomotion? And so the system that we have right now is we have two bacteria, one in which causes an effect on the behavior, and then one that does not cause an effect on the behavior. And so what we can do is we can take this system and basically pit the two against each other 
and ask the question, how do they differ? And that can then address the question of how is Brevis doing this? And so one of the ways in which they can differ is through that of colonization. So different bacteria can colonize or can be within a host at different numbers. And so this is the colonization level. And so what might be happening is that Lactobacillus plantarum actually might be at such low numbers that it's not able to cause an effect. And so it's not just something that is inherent to Lactobacillus brevis in this case, but it's something that plantarum can do, it just doesn't have enough of them to do it. And so in order to test this, what we need to do is we need to look at the numbers of bacteria that are within our monocolonized mice and ask the question, do these two differ from each other? And so when we do this, we count the bacteria through colony forming units. And so this is just taking the host and basically looking at how many bacteria are within the host. And what we find is that there's no significant difference between our flies that are monocolonized with Lactobacillus plantarum and those that are monocolonized with Lactobacillus brevis, indicating that it is not an effect through colonization. So another way in which these two bacteria can differ is through that of bacterial products. Because although they are the same genera, they can actually produce wildly different bacterial products. And so what we need to do is we need to look at the bacteria versus its products. So it might be that you need the bacteria to associate with the epithelium in order to cause an effect. Or it might be that the bacterial products are actually what's causing an effect. So you might only need them to have this effect on locomotion. And so for this, what we did was we had to separate out our bacteria from our spent media, or from our bacterial products. And so what we did for this is we basically took a bacterial culture, we spun it down, so we centrifuged it, and then filtered it. So we have no viable bacteria in this spent media. We have only the bacterial products. And so what we're looking for here is if the spent media is able to cause an effect, we should see the exact same effect with the spent media as we do with this whole bacterial culture. However, if it's just the bacterium that's needed, then we should be able to not see an effect. So it would be similar to that of Lactobacillus plantarum. And when we add back just the spent media, what we find is that it is, in fact, able to cause an effect, indicating that it is something that within the spent media, so it's a bacterial product that is causing this effect. And so it's actually this bacterial product. So now what we need to do is we need to separate out the bacterial products and ask the question, what particular bacterial product is actually causing this effect? And so one way in which we can separate them out is by size. And so how we can do this is through size exclusion chromatography. And basically what we do for this is we take a mixture of molecules. So in our case, it would be a mixture within the spent media and we take it and we pour it over a set of porous beads. And what happens is basically that the smaller material, so the smaller molecules, actually get stuck within those porous beads. And so then what we have is we have now a differential based on the size of the particular molecule. And so things that are bigger will come out first, and things that are smaller will come out later. And the units for size that I'm going to talk about are that of KD, or kilodaltons. So things that are, have a bigger kilodalton will come out first, and those that have a smaller will come out later. And so the size fractions that I'm talking about, one of which is that of things that are less than 30 kilodaltons. An example of this is something like water, glucose, or ATP. And the next, the next size fraction that we looked at was that of something that is between 30 to 70 kilodaltons. An example of this is something like hemoglobin. And these, are not these examples are not necessarily produced by our bacterium. They're just examples of those particular sizes. And then the next fraction that we decided to look at was something that was greater than 70 kilodons. So something on the order of rhinovirus. And so what we're looking for here is in our particular fractions, we're looking to see whether one of them or all of them or maybe a couple of them have this particular effect on the host. And so what we first look at was we first looked at that greater than 70 kilodalton fraction. And what we find is that it is in fact not able to cause an effect on speed. And so therefore it is not 
things that are greater than 70 kilodaltons that are causing an effect. And so next, we moved on to our 30 to 70 kilodalton size range. And what we find is that this particular fraction is actually able to cause an effect on locomotion, indicating that there is probably a product within this particular size range that is causing the effect. However, we can't just exclude the less than 30 kilodalton fraction because it might just be that there might be other products that are smaller than 30 kilodaltons that can actually cause the same effect. And so we next looked at that less than 30 kilodalton fraction. And what we find is that this fraction is not able to produce a significant effect on the speed of the flies, indicating that our particular molecule of inter interest is between 30 to 70 kilodaltons. And so next, we need to look at what type of molecule it might be. And so there are many different types of molecules. There are carbohydrates, nucleic acids, proteins, and lipids. And we've already looked at carbohydrates and nucleic acids and found that they have no effect. And so I'll concentrate on our data on the proteins. And so the first question that we're asking is, is it a protein? And in order to be able to understand if it is a protein, is that we need to understand that a protein is made up of amino acids. And so we need to be able to essentially functionally inactivate that protein. And so one of the ways in which you can do this is through adding trypsin. And so trypsin is an enzyme which can basically cleave apart a protein. And so if you think about it in terms of an elastic band or scrunchie as your protein, trypsin is like scissors basically going through that particular scrunchie. So it's no longer able to be used to hold up your hair or to hold anything together. And so that's what we find with trypsin. It's able to cleave the protein into peptides and so now inactivate that particular protein. And so what we're asking here, if it is a protein, is that it will now be inactivated by this particular trypsin treatment. And so what we're looking for for that case is we're looking for it to now, the level of the speed to be now at the same level of that of the xenic flies. However, if it's not a protein, then it should be able to cause this exact same effect on speed. And what we find is that when we add trypsin, it now causes the flies to move around similar to that of the xenic flies, indicating that our molecule of interest is a protein. Additionally, when we do the control for this, we find that it is able to cause an effect, indicating that it's not just a, a method of the process or product of the process. And so what we have found is that lactobacillus brevis is able to cause an effect on locomotion and is able to do this through a 30 to 70 kilodalton protein. And so now what we were trying to do is we were trying to do proteomic strategies in order to be able to further identify this particular protein. <coughs> but our next question is how does the protein signal to the host? And so the way in which I've been addressing this is through basically a black box. And so the microbiota or this particular protein could be signaling and needs to be signaling through the epithelium or through some particular pathway in order to be affecting locomotion. And so one of the first questions we ask for this is, is it mass? So you might think of this in terms of if a fly is heavier than another fly, it would be moving around slower. And when we looked at this, we found that there were no significant effects between our groups. And so next, we looked at the glucose levels of the flies, because different glucose levels within the flies can actually cause them to have different differences in their locomotion. And so when we looked at this, we found that there were no significant effects between the glucose levels. Next, what we need to look at was that of immunity or immune pathways, because normally within the gut, within the epithelium, there's usually signaling through the immune system and through immune receptors. And so it might be that our particular protein of interest is actually signaling through these commonly known particular receptors. And one of which we looked at is that of the IMD receptor, which is most commonly found in the gut. However, we found that it was not able to cause a significant effect. Additionally, we also looked at other behaviors in order to see whether this particular protein is causing an effect on another behavior like that of feeding. So we looked at food intake. And what we found is that there was no significant effects on food intake, indicating that this was more specific to that of locomotion. And so the other ways in which we're currently exploring is we're currently looking into that of nutrient sensors. 
So it might be that this particular protein is causing an effect on a nutrient sensor, and then that is causing an effect on locomotion. And so it might be causing an effect through the insulin receptor, as well as through an amino acid transporter called SlimFast. And so we're currently trying to evaluate this. Additionally, another way in which it might be causing an effect is through that of neural activity. So it might be that our particular protein is actually causing an effect on the circuitry. And we are currently looking into whether there is a difference in the activity of particular circuits based on the presence or absence of this particular protein. And so we really don't know how this particular protein right now is signaling through the host. And so that's currently in progress. And so what we have found is that Lactobacillus brevis, not Lactobacillus plantarum, and not some of the other organisms, however, there is an effect through Acetobacter tropicalis, is causing an effect on locomotion. And this effect through of Lactobacillus brevis is mediated through a 30 to 70 kilodalton protein. And so the major question that you might be asking yourself is that why? Why would a particular bacterial system or a particular biological system be causing this effect? And so you can probably think of a couple of different hypotheses, but the one in which we've been thinking about relates back to the first example I gave for the importance of locomotion. And so locomotion is important in terms of finding, locating, and staying with a particular nutritive source. And Lactobacillus brevis is actually found on that of fermented cheeses and fermented wine and things of that nature. Additionally, Drosophila are found on those particular products and actually those are their preferential foods of interest. And so it might be that this particular protein is basically signaling to the host a stop signal to basically stop and stay on that particular nutritive source. And so it's not that it's attracting that particular nutritive source or that particular back, um, host, but it's that it's creating this signal to stop its locomotion and to stop moving and feed. And so with that, I hope that through this talk, you'll be able to gain a more deep understanding of the microbiota and be able to understand that the microbiota is more of engaged in terms of a partnership with you and your microbiota. And that this partnership is actually one in which that is not only focused on the local effects in terms of its effect on that of the gut, but also can affect that of behavior and just your day-to-day -day activity. And so I'd like to thank my advisor, Sarkis Mesmanian, for allowing me to do this project. I'd also like to thank the Mesmanian Lab um, for all of their help with this. And I'd like to specifically thank Hugh, um, which is a postdoc in our lab, um, for all of her help and mentorship with this project, as well as Matt uh, Meyerowitz and Matt Smalley for their help on another part of the project that I didn't have time to talk about, as well as Nikki Cruz for giving um, some of the graphics that I showed. And I'd also like to thank the Aravin and Zayas Toffs Labs for allowing me to do my fly work in their uh, fly room. Um, and I'd also like to thank our collaborators, the Marka Lab, Yoast at the Protein Expression Center, and also the Caltech Exploration Lab, who are currently um, looking into find that particular protein. And so with that, I'll take any questions that you guys might have. The question is trying to look at the genomes of those that do have an effect and those that don't and trying to compare those two and see whether there's actually a difference there. And yeah, so that's actually what we were trying to get at with the strains and also looking at those different particular types of bacteria. Um, however, Acetobacter tropicalis, that particular one is actually not annotated. So um, it's difficult for me to compare those two. And since there's such differences between Lactobacillus plantarum and Brevis, um, that's really difficult for us to be able to get at, but um, it's something that we are trying to do with the proteomic strategy of trying to look at those two and compare them. Okay, so the question is that you're asking is basically, in terms of the, um, the why that I was asking, um, is that included already in my data, or, and also, is that data actually separated out? And so with the stop signal, we can test that in different ways. And actually, you know, you are right in terms of the speed, we can look at the stop starting of the particular flies. And what we find is that in terms of the speed, they actually are faster. 
Um, so it's not just that stop-start that's causing an effect. Um, the stop-start is different, however, it's not significant. Um, and then in terms of whether they are actually convolved together, um, so in terms of tripod index, so that is something that is actually correlated with that of a faster speed. So it can be kind of um, you know, jumbled up because it's difficult with locomotion to separate it out into particular features, especially with the gait. Um, but what we're trying to get at here is to look at whether it's kind of a more minute capability to fly, so in terms of proprioception, basically feedback and stuff like that. Um, and what we find is that in terms of the activity and the speed, those are very separate um, in terms of trying to look at those two particular. Um, so maybe not as much with that particular feature of the gate. However, there are some significant differences in terms of the other features that we looked at in the gate. Um, so that indicates that there actually might be, um, that those two are more actually more separate than, than I showed. Oh, but we did check um, and we added back the bacterium actually at a later stage in order to look and see whether that caused an effect and they were still able to have an effect. So it's not based on development of the fly. It's actually something that can happen over the course of its lifetime. And we were able to do the same conversely with adding um, antibiotics. 